Well, listen, <clears throat> what it is I want to talk to you today, and this is a fairly comprehensive uh, uh, process that we're going to go through in the next few uh, minutes, but I want to share with you the five-step development process. The development, basically, there are five steps in the process, and I think to the degree that you understand them, you're really going to be able to move forward in terms of your organization. So let's uh, move on, and we start with the first uh, of the uh, five-step processes. Uh, the first step is the identification of potential prospects. In other words, you want to build relationships with people. Uh, you want to have them engaged in the context of your ministry. And uh, we need to identify these people uh, with whom you would like to build a relationship. And it begins with people that you know. In other words, uh, you know, oftentimes we, we feel like, well, we don't even know people that we really would like to have a relationship with. Um, and so you know, what do we do? Well, first of all, start with people that you know, family, friends, neighbors, businesses, colleagues, friends at church. Uh, all of those people represent what I call a universe. So think of a small circle. And within that circle are people that you know very, very well, people that you basically represent those um, people that basically we included, family, friends, neighbors, and so forth. Uh, but you also have, uh, your friends also know other people. In other words, uh, I'm, I know, you know, 40 or 50 people. Uh, it used to be, you know, years ago when we were talking about this discussion, uh, that the average, what we call the average universe of the average individual in America, and this was probably 20 or 30 years ago, was about 40 people. That actually, there were about 40 people that you know that if you were facing a crisis, you could go to them and the realities are they would listen to what it is that you have to say because you've earned their confidence by virtue of the fact of the relationship that you have. Well, now it's kind of interesting because uh, people are thinking, you know, how, how large is your universe? I mean, how, I mean, it's not just your friends, but now you have many, many more friends. Uh, one of the favorite things that I like to do when I go to a, a restaurant, uh, especially if there's a millennial in the room and uh, they're getting ready to you know take my my uh, order for my for my dinner or lunch or breakfast whatever the case might be and, and i'll usually ask them i said well uh, are you on facebook and they say yeah i'm on facebook i said how many how many names how, how many friends do you have she says 3415 uh, and all of these people on, you know, that, that person basically said, these are all my friends. Well, most of them don't even know any of them. But, uh, but the realities are, you know, we have to begin the process of development by identifying people uh, that we can begin a relationship with. So let's kind of go on from there. Getting to know others. How do you get to find people? Uh, how do we get people to, you know, be exposed to what it is that we do, the ministry to which we've committed ourselves? Well, here's one way you could do it is invite others to attend an event. You know, conduct an open house or host a special lecture or a special event like a musical uh, theater uh, or a concert or whatever the case might be. But those are all ways of being able to bring people to expose them to what it is that you're doing. So consider hosting an event. Uh, introduce introduce uh, yourself and your organization. You know, share information about your work, always providing something that they can take home with them. Uh, so let's say that you go to a, an open house and you basically you're being introduced to the organization, you're showing them what it is that you do, you're allowing them the opportunity to respond to questions and all the kinds of things that most all of us would do on a regular basis. And then, you know, during that period of time, because you really wanna take advantage of that because it's one thing to have an organization, to have a meeting and to have people come to the meeting. But if you don't give them the opportunity of being able to participate in any kind of way as it relates to the ongoing ministry of the organization and what might be of interest to them, then the realities are you've lost the opportunity. And so what we want you to do is what a, a process that we call bridging. Now think of a bridge as uh, if you wanna use a, a, a bit of a diagram that might stick with you because it's one of the diagrams that I share periodically with organizations that they really often relate to. So uh, if you have a piece of paper and you're sitting there as I'm talking, uh, here's what I'd like you to do. Uh, make a, a little ocean, okay? Just make a little line that basically reflects ocean and then underneath that put some stick, 
stick uh, fishes there. You know, people, you know, are uh, all the, the fish that are in the sea, okay? And in the middle of this sea, uh, put a, a little knob there, and we're going to make it an island, okay? So on the middle of this island, uh, this, this sea of uh, opportunity, th there is an island. And that island, on that island, there's a beautiful house, okay? So try to get that image in your mind. Here we have a, a, a sea, in the sea of prospects, there are all kinds of people there, and you all know that. There are all kinds, I mean, you have prayer, potential prayer partners, you have, uh, you know, volunteers, prepare, you know, a lot of volunteers that would be available to you. They're, they're all down in the sea of prospects, but most of them don't have a clue who you are. And think of other people in organizations that are a part of the sea of prospects that you, you'd really like to engage people, wealthy people, uh, all kinds of people basically are there, but they don't have a clue who you are and what it is that you do. So we all can relate to that because we know that their resources are available, but we don't know how to gather and engage in those resources. Well, think about taking an arrow, and if you can take an arrow from the Sea of Prospects up to the front porch of the house, put a little front porch in the house. And that front porch of the house is just basically an opportunity for you to uh, go to an organization to be exposed to what it is that they do. And when you do that figuratively, you kind of open the door, don't you? And you let them peek into what it is that uh, you do. And, uh, and basically they have a wonderful experience and uh, they're grateful for the opportunity to be exposed to something that they really didn't know much about. Uh, and usually when that event is over, what typically we do is we close the door, say, thanks for coming, God bless you, and uh, let's go home. Well, I mean, the realities are most of you or many of you do that on a fairly regular basis. You have great events, expose people to something that basically was quite meaningful. And at the end of the day, we say, you know, God bless you, thank you. Uh, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you sometime in the future. Well, usually nothing happens there. But the realities are that a bridge is something that you need to do. And think of the bridge as this, you're on the front step, you're on the front porch of the house, and then you're going to walk over the threshold and you're going to end up in the foyer. And so you're extending essentially an invitation. Won't you come in and let us really show you around what it is that is happening within the context of our organization. The process of extending an invitation is essentially a bridge. You want to move them from one place to another. And then the successful result of a bridge is, is, is actually a relationship. So, uh, let me give you some examples of bridging really, really quickly. Uh, if I were, let's say that uh, you come to my organization, let's say I'm the administrator of a Christian school or an organization. And so at the end of the meeting, after we've had a wonderful time together, uh, I stand up and say, hey, listen, thank you so much for coming. It was just really great to have you here. You've seen uh, some of the videos that we provided that talk about what it is that we're doing. Uh, many of you uh, have uh, experienced uh, situations that uh, you've, you, you, you found to be interesting. Uh, and, and you perhaps have heard the testimonies of some of the kids and some of the people that are part of our organization. And I'd just like to share with you five or six ways that you could be a part of our organization. You know, maybe you'd like, and I give them a card which basically has a number of options wherein they might consider opportunities. So you might wanna, you know, just pray for us. If you know what it is that we're doing, we'd love for you to be one of our prayer partners. And we're very happy, you know, if you would like to be one of our prayer partners, we can send you a 31 day prayer guide. Uh, and you can pray for us on a daily basis on what it is that, you know, God is doing in our organization and how you can support us uh, in terms of prayer. Uh, so if you are interested in that, just check that box. And we'll make sure you get a 31 day prayer guide that you can put on your refrigerator uh, in a magnet or something of that nature. Uh, you know, there's other ways that you can be involved. If you'd like to uh, be a volunteer, uh, check there. We have lots of opportunity volunteer or volunteer opportunities. So if you have an interest there, just check that box. That would be fine. You know, if you'd like to um, receive a copy of our uh, v VIP newsletter, this is an email letter that basically share, we send it once a month and it shares some of the issues that are taking place. And, if you're, uh, if you're interested in what it is we're doing and how we're going about doing it, you're a very important person to us. And we wanna send you the information that basically is going to enable you to understand better who it is and what we do. Uh, we, you might you know, sh share with them 
uh, that you need in-kind contributions. Uh, and so if you have something that you want to give to our organization, yeah, then just check that box. We'll make sure that we provide what it is that you need in order for us to uh, take advantage of what it is that you really want us to become involved in. I, and I could go on and on with six or seven or even eight different ways in which you could be participants in what it is that we do. Well, each one of those participants is essentially a bridge. And, and now we have the opportunity of really able to, to grow in that relationship. So bridging is, is essentially the failure to bridge is the, the greatest mistake that we make in development. You bring a lot of people to the front porch, but if you never extend to them the invitation, you've lost opportunity. So bridging is something that you must do virtually in everything that you do, allowing people the opportunity to do what it is. They're not going to expend the energy to try to figure out how to deal what it is you want them to do. So the realities are, if you're not going to expend the invitation or the opportunities, then the realities are you're not going to have the opportunities that you really want. So identification of prospects is very, very important. That's just a few other things here in relationship to this discussion and we can kind of move forward. A prospect is a prospect only when you have their name and contact information. In other words, you say, we got all these people that came. I mean, we had 400 people that showed up to the, the uh, open house. Great. Uh, how, how many names and addresses did we get? Well, we didn't get any, but we had a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of encouragement. Well, the realities are you didn't accomplish anything for all practical purposes. So you really, I mean, one of the aspects of what it is that we need to do is basically to get the names and contact information of people that basically we can begin the process of building a relationship. It's one thing to say that you have a lot of friends or potential prospects, but it's quite another to have the information you need in order to grow your ministry and outreach. Okay, that's number one. So number one, identify people with whom you'd like to build a relationship and kind of think of ways that you might be able to do that. Well, virtually not everybody is going to be in the same relationship as the person next to them in line. In other words, there are a lot of people, we have a lot of prospects now, and we're saying, oh man, look at this, we've got 500 prospects here, now what do we do with them? And we realize intuitively that not every one of them is in the same relationship as the person next in line alphabetically. So there are three kinds of prospects. And, and so now I have an organization, uh, Habitat for Humanity is one of our clients, they have 11, listen, 11 million people on their database. 11 million people on their database. And I can tell you, and we're going to kind of walk through this over the period of time that we have remaining, but I can tell you where virtually every one of those people, all 11 million people are in relationship to the organization. And what we did in the context of that ministry to grow that ministry is one of the greatest organizations in the world today. So here are the three kinds of prospects that we all have. First of all, a nuclear prospect. Now a nuclear prospect is someone, some, some part of an organization that, that benefit directly from the services you provide. Now let's say that you're a part of a Christian school, for example. A nuclear prospect would be someone that basically benefits directly from the services that we provide because their child is a part of their uh, school and, and so they, as an organization, are benefiting directly from the services that the organization provides. But there's another group of uh, prospects, and we call those affinity prospects. Now, an affinity prospect is, represents a group of people who benefit indirectly from the services you provide. In other words, they, they don't experience the same thing that a nuclear prospect does, but they, they are obviously involved in some degree with the organization. So for example, if my, if I, my son or my grandson, I have a, three grandsons, which are no longer children anymore, but you know, we really appreciated that organization, the Christian school of which they attended because it really impacted their lives. And, uh, but there were affinity prospects. I mean, there were cousins and neighbors and people that basically were aware of what it is that we were going. We didn't know them as well as the others, but the realities are we did know that they were interested in what it is we're doing. So they have some sense of a relationship with you. And then the third area is what we call a fringe prospect. And this group represents people with whom uh, you have no relationship. In other words, you, don't, you, you know that they're there, you know community leaders are there, you know 
philanthropic people are there. We know that business leaders and, uh, are there. We, we know that they're there. Wealthy people are there. Foundations are there. We know all about that, but the realities are we don't know anything about them. So here now you have a, a database. You're beginning to create you know, relationships, and we know that within the numbers of people that we have in our database, they're going to be in one of three broad categories. They're going to be nuclear prospects, Kennedy prospects, or French prospects, okay? Now I'm going to go through this rapidly because there's just an, an awful lot to do here. So we, we've now come to a point where we said, okay, we, we know that we have uh, all these people in our database and we have some kind of an idea in terms of what their relationship might be with us. Well, you know, we restarted, and I'm sure you remember this as we were beginning uh, all of this earlier uh, in this session, but um, we used the analogy of falling in love, didn't we? And so it, the third aspect of the developmental process, identify number one, qualify number two, cultivate number three. And cultivating, using the analogy of falling in love, is, is, is this next step. And it's kind of analogous to courtship. And, and I realize that certain practices are different in many areas of the world, but uh, you know, courtship was you know, really a great time in our lives, you know, and Sue and I were courting one another and determining whether or not this is what it is we felt God was gonna lead us to do. So how do we grow relationships? And uh, so let me give you three thoughts that you might wanna consider. Uh, well, you need to get, the, get to know them, don't you? Uh, so you can grow a relationship by getting to know others and things like events and activities are excellent ways to expose your ministry to other people. So again, going back to what it is that we did at the first session, you know, identifying prospects, you, you want them to come to something. You want them to be able to experience what it is that the organization represents. The next step is involvement. You know, you really want to get people involved. And the more people become involved in what you do, the more committed they are. And you need to provide them ways. How, you think about this, how could someone become involved in your organization? Well, they could become a volunteer. Uh, you know, that certainly is, a, is an obvious one. Um, but there are all kinds of other ways that they could become involved. And think about ways that people could become involved in your organization because to the extent that they become involved, they're taking a kind of a part of the ownership of what it is the organization represents. And then finally, um, the third area, is donation. Now, by the way, I don't like that fact. I, I, I'd like to change that, but I'll explain that in just a few moments. But the realities are AID, I just couldn't, I, I had to keep it only because I could remember it forever. And so I, when I talk about don, donations here, I'm talking about people who commit to you uh, are making a statement of their interest. That doesn't necessarily involve money as much as it represents a commitment to becoming involved in what it is that you do. You, people, think of it this way, you know, people that go out of their way to support what it is that you do that goes far beyond what it is you would ex expect them to do. And so they're, they're making a commitment or a sacrifice or a donation. Uh, and basically that is, you know, re allows us to be able to understand, uh, you know, where they might be in terms of their commitment to the organization. Let's go on. Commitment, um, and I'm gonna go back here because I, there's a few things here. I went up forward before I, I was ready to stop. But uh, think about um, cultivation again. Let me just kind of go over this really, really quickly. Um, if, if you had a database, all right, now we have a database. We know that we have nuclear affinity and French prospects within the database. And within the database, we also know that we have individuals that we want to grow in their relationship with one another. And so aid enables us to be able to say, okay, if we had people that were attending and if they were involved and they were making contributions, then they were out of there, we'd call them a, an A prospect, all right? If they, were do, if they had done all three of those things. Now, some of them, you know, have attended something, but they haven't involved and haven't donated. So the realities are, you know, our goal is to get them to get, become involved in something. And so we provide opportunities, a variety of opportunities where they can become involved. And so they've done two of the three. In other words, you've, they've attended, they've been involved, and they make a commitment. 
Now that commitment might be uh, a sacrifice doing in over and above what it is that realistically you would expect to happen uh, or as a result of the, the, that particular communication. Aid, okay, so think of it this way. If, if, all, if they did all three of those things, attendance and involvement and donation, we'd call them an A, we'd call them a, you know, an A prospect. If they if they'd done two of the three, we'd call them a B prospect because they've attended and they've been involved. They would D if they had been making sacrifices, then they've attended, involved, and made donations. And then there's a, let's say it's an A, B, C, D thing that A prospects are the best prospects, obviously Bs are the next best, that's involvement. These are the ones that have made donations, you know, whatever the case might be. And then the other ones, basically they're D prospects and we don't know anything about them. We don't know anything about what it is that they've done in the past. The, the realities are that if you were sitting and, and writing a letter or wanting to communicate with somebody, uh, the, the realities are that 90% of the people that you would talk to would probably listen to what it is that you have to say because you've really delved yourself into the, into the relationship. In other words, you've, you've, you've done, attended, you've involved in your doing, and, and the reality is if you're gonna send them a letter, if you wanna get them engaged in something, that group of people is gonna be the most likely to want to support you. Now, you know, there are other people that basically, you know, have not done, uh, they've never made a contribution, they've never, um, done some of the other things, but if, if, if they've done two of the three, there's a 60% likelihood that a person would be able to, uh, would want to be involved if in fact we were extending an invitation. If they've done one of the three, in other words, they've, they've, the, the only thing that they've done is attended something, there's about a 30% likelihood that they're going to do anything. Uh, if inv invited the opportunity, and if they, if you finish and they and you don't have anything, then the realities are there's less than that 10% likelihood that they're going to respond to anything that you have to do. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. I know I'm running through this quickly, but I really want to make sure that we get as much of this as we can. Okay, now let's talk about commitment. So we've identified number one, qualify number two, cultivate number three. And number four is to seek a commitment. So this fourth step involves inviting others to join with you in growing your organization. And for that, there's a, con a lot of ways that you can do that. I like the pro a formal proposal. If I am ready to start talking to someone about engaging with the organization, then I want to, you know, basically, you know, present to them an opportunity that allows them the opportunity to uh, become engaged in very, very meaningful ways in support of our organization. And I do that by creating a formal proposal. Now I can give you samples of formal proposals, but usually they have a cover, you know, that basically shares the organization and what it is that, and usually it's personalized to the individual that I want to visit with and to share with them the opportunity of participating. So the formal proposal would include at least five things. It's listed here in the, in the, the, uh, PowerPoint that I have provided here for you that's available. The first step, I mean, the things that you want to include in this proposal is the mission of your organization. Why do you exist? They need to know that because that's the essence of who it is you are. And that's why mission is so very, very important to the whole developmental process. And it, then you want to talk to them about a brief history. Uh, there's some people that in the UK, we were talking to a couple of them just this earlier this week, you know, that basically they can walk down a street in, in uh, London and they can see a haberdash haberdashery, uh, you know, that was, uh, you know, from 1736. In other words, they have a lot of credibility only by virtue of the fact that they have history. Uh, the one thing that I, you know, regret, at least I, I suppose at one level is, is that, uh, you know, my history is getting a little bit longer as well. And, uh, um, but, but the realities are, it gives you credibility. The older you are, the more credible you are, right? I mean, it, you'd like to think so. Uh, and the realities are, the, uh, the longer an organization has existed and has been using and being used of the Lord, the realities are, it, it's a credible organization because of the success that they've had over many, many years. Uh, you want to provide a vibrant description of your vision for the future. In other words, uh, start talking about the big vision on the pyramid. 
you know, share, you know, when people were talking to Bill Bright, you know, he says, let me just share with you. And, and Bill was really quite an interesting guy, I had the opportunity of working with him and that organization for several years. And the realities are that, you know, Bill could tell a great story. He said, close your eyes and let me take you to Papua New Guinea. And then he's just kind of walking me through, you know, a jungle that finally opens up to an open area where there's a lot of people that basically are preparing to hear and see the, per the, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ for the first time in their lives. And, and he's, that was the vision. It was a vibrant description. And you just basically, you know, couldn't hardly stop not doing, doing anything because of the, it, you, the realization of what it is that was going to impact in their lives. Okay, then you need an outline of your strategic plan. We're, okay, we have a mission, we have a vision, we've got a, uh, or we have a history, mission and history, a vision, and, and then we, but we've got a plan. Here's our plan and what it is we're going to do. In the case of habit, or not habitat, but of uh, uh, crew, was that the strategic plan was that we want to make sure that 4.3 billion people have the opportunity of seeing the Jesus film uh, by the, um, the year 2000. And that happened between 1978 and 2000. All of that happened and that was the strategic plan. And then the final thing that you want to do when you're making this professional and, and hopefully a personal commitment or a personal invitation to join you is uh, to provide a wide range of ways in which they can commit to support. Uh, this is one of the, the big things that I'm very, very committed to is I want everybody to say yes to something. In other words, if I'm just saying, you know, would you like to give a contribution to a million dollars? And that's the only thing that I ever say, I might get the million dollars and I might not. And if I don't get it, I probably will never hear or see the person again, because they're going to say, what gave you the audacity of saying that I could give a million dollars when you don't even know me? Well, that's obviously uh, not something that you would want to happen. So what we do is we provide uh, a variety of ways. Um, and again, I've gone ahead of myself on the screen. So let me, before I stop that, Let's just talk a little bit about, you know, the uh, what I call the opportunity page, because in every personalized proposal, I always include, and I would recommend that you do the same thing, that I always include a series of ways in which they could become involved. And all of, at least many of which is something that anybody could respond to, uh, if in fact they were interested at all in what it is that we're doing. So when we present a proposal, we say, okay, there's maybe six or eight areas that we're saying, okay, um, <clears throat> you know, you could pray for us. If you, if, if, you, if you love what it is we're doing, if you really believe in what it is we're doing, we re really want you to, to pray for us. We'd like you to be a volunteer, you know, kinds of things that basically, if people have an interest at all in what it is we want them to do, we want them to be able to say yes to something and come up with some questions that basically they can say yes to. And, and here's another clue, just to remind you, is that, um, the trouble with getting old is that you remember what the last statement that was you were just going to make. So let me kind of move on that. But, but the reality is that give them the opportunity to be able to respond to something. And, uh, and you want it to do, you want them to do it then. That was my point. In other words, give them a place where they can check it, and they can you know, say, okay, I, I can do this or I can do that. Uh, it's kind of interesting when you do this in a, a large situation where you have a lot of people and we do a lot of organizations like that and in, in, in situations that would be somewhat analogous to what it is that I'm, what I'm talking about now. And we give them this little card that says, okay, here are some ways that you can become involved in what it is that we're doing. And it, would you please check if you want this, that, and the other thing. We talked a little bit about that already earlier. Well, the realities are, if you say, you know, we'd like you to just, you know, take, take a few minutes to do this now. And when you leave, put it in a box, you know, so that we know that you were here and, and here are ways that we might be able to support you and provide the information that you want. But if they walk out and they don't make the decision, it's kind of interesting. There's about a 70% likelihood that if you do it and you give them the opportunities to make a decision, especially not necessarily in a major campaign or something, but whenever you're asking somebody for something, at least give them some opportunities wherein they can participate. And if they walk away and they don't do anything, the realities are there's about a 30% loss uh, because they get into the car on the way home, they say, oh yeah, this was really great, it was wonderful, and they're sharing it with your wife and your friends and so forth, and, 
and uh, says, yeah, we really want to be involved in this. And, and then all of a sudden you get a phone call from the babysitter who says, you know, the baby's sick and you need to get home. And uh, all of a sudden, everything that was really very impactful in terms of the relationship and, and what it is that you really wanted to do from the event that you just left, all of a sudden we've just lost that. And remember, again, one of the most important statements that I made earlier is that uh, we, we want you know, people to, to respond. And it's emotion that brings us together. Always remember that statement. It's emotion that brings us together in relationships. It's rationalism that keeps us there. That first statement is an emotional one. And you have to grow those emotions, you know, and provide opportunities wherein people can become involved. And, uh, and basically, if you don't, then the realities are you're likely to lose them. Okay, so now we're going to get to the last part of it. And uh, we call this the sustaining uh, the involvement of others. Okay, so now we've identified people with whom we'd like to build a relationship. That's number one. Number two, we want to qualify them. We know they're all different. We want to begin to understand who they are, what it is that's important to them and so forth, and how to move them up the ladder from where it is they are to where it is that we would hope that they would go. Uh, the third thing is we want to uh, cultivate those relationships. And that's, a, a, you, I have teams of people with organizations that we work with that basically focus on cultivation. You know, if somebody's never done anything, we want to invite them to something. You know, if they've never been involved in anything, we want to provide some opportunities wherein they can do that if in fact they have the interest in doing it and so forth. So we want to cultivate those relationships and to move them into a very good place in terms of their relationship with the organization. And then the, uh, we went there from, you know, engagement, you know, how do we, you know, basically we've, we've identified, qualified, cultivated, and now we want to provide opportunities wherein they can become involved. We want to allow them the opportunity to see that, but now we want to sustain them. And there are two parts of that whole process, as we've talked about. On the left-hand side of the doc, of a image that I gave you earlier uh, in this session, or in a couple of sessions ago, is that in the first part of the, what I call the relational continuum, you know, basically you're going from someone that didn't know anything to basically a commitment. Remember we were talking about the greatest analogy of falling in love is, is, is marriage. And, and, and so, you know, we started with not knowing someone. I met Sue, I saw her, I liked her, I thought she was brilliant, I thought she was funny, and I really did enjoy her. You know, as the time went on, we had this, you know, significant meeting in the meantime of that whole courtship process where I began to say to her, you know, if we were to take this to the next level, if we, all of a sudden, I and me was early, now it's we, you always want to go to we. You want them to be able to say, you know, here are ways that you can be involved in us and, and we would love for you to do that. So that was day, uh, AID, AID, that was all on that left side of the continuum from the, the beginning when Sue and I first met each other to the marriage and when we committed ourselves to one another, for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse, in sickness and in health until death to us part. Okay, that was, now we're into a, no, a new phase of our life. And that's, you know, basically how do we sustain a vital relationship with somebody that we really deeply care about? And that's the CIA function, uh, which basically CIA stands for uh, an acronym. Uh, C stands for communicating, continuing and maintaining communications with people that are part of your organization, providing ongoing going opportunities to maintain their involvement, and constantly reminding others of your appreciation of their involvement. That's CIA. And stop and think about it even in a marital relationship. You know, when, and I think I gave this illustration earlier, but when, you know, Sue and I, you know, we had our honeymoon and, and uh, you know, it was just, we, we reflected on all the things that had happened to prepare us for that particular moment in our lives. And, uh, you know, as time went on, you know, we weren't talking quite as much as we used to. Uh, we, you know, when we were courting, you know, they would kick us out of restaurants because uh, they wanted to go home so that they could, you know, come back to work the next day. And so we'd leave, close the door, get in our car and continue to talk. Well, now as time goes on, we don't typically or we oftentimes don't com uh, typically communicate in the same way. 
and we're not involved in oftentimes in the same ways that we were as we were courting. And we uh, sometimes don't express appreciation in the ways that we should. And so we can do that on an individual basis, but we can also do it as an organizational basis. And, um, and Sue and I had to work on that in our lives. And I suspect those of you that are married and have had similar experiences had to do that in your life as well. But in the case of development, if I'm looking at your situation, I would say, uh, you know, you want to have, and I, I gave the illustration of Billy Graham, I think earlier, Billy Graham, you know, was a great evangelist and he would have a service in London and then the next week he'd be in Spain and then the next week he'd be in Madrid and then the next day he'd be, you know, in, in uh, Frankfurt or some other place. And, and he would do that year after year after. That was what his vision was. I mean, that was his vision and that was really his giftedness. And, 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 and Billy was very, very good at that. But, but the realities are, you know, there was still this follow-up aspect of what it is that needed to happen. And, uh, and my wife is a great example of this because Sue came to know the Lord at a Billy Graham uh, campaign in Chicago, Illinois. And uh, she was a 20 year old graduate of a uh, uh, university. And, uh, and she came to, to uh, this uh, great event in Chicago and she came to know the Lord. And she went forward and she was met with somebody when she got there. And it was a lovely lady who was probably in her 70s or 80s. And she was saying, Dan, do you know what it is that you just did? And she, she began to share that. And she prayed with my, my, my wife. I was, she was still, she wasn't my wife at the time. And, uh, and that lady gave her some information. And for almost a year, that lady stayed with her, gave her information, talked to her, and finally got her into a church and so forth. And, and, and that was all part of that ministry. And, and, she, and there were thousands of other people that were doing the same thing with these people that were really coming to faith in Christ. And so they were working on one side of the continuum uh, and the other side of the continuum, you know, Billy was working on. And we need to do that with our organizations. You might have a group of people within your organization that basically are the acquisition people, okay? They're the Billy Grahams. They're the ones that are basically sharing who it is you are and what it is that you want to do and, and all those wonderful things that basically is, you, know, you can accomplish in your ministry. So, you, you know, you may be, that's where your heart is, and this is really what you want to be involved in. But there are another group of people that don't know how to do that, but they know how to do other things. They know how to communicate with people. They know how to get them involved and, and they stay in contact by sending letters and Christmas cards and the kinds of things that basically say, you really mean a lot to us and we really want you to know that. And so essentially in development, you have two broad areas, the acquisition and the sustaining. You know, there's visual people, there are people that, you know, I, I've always kind of needed people to you know, explain something to me because I don't really get it. And uh, I start reading books about, you know, how to make my internet work. And, and then finally I hire a guy to, for $125 to do it. And I'm really happy about myself. Um, so so uh, I think, you know, we're all a little bit different, but I, I've always wanted to see the big picture. That's why I love the pyramid because I can relate to that. Uh, and I, in, in working with people and we've had clients in uh, I think 3,700 countries around the world uh, that we've worked with organizations and, and uh, you know, that means a, a great deal to me, but uh, what it is that I think I've learned from people is that if you do this, this will happen. And uh, I, I remember when I first started my, in a consulting business, I'd been a vice president for advancement for a university and, and now I was, you know, starting a, this was 40 years ago or so, where we were actually working with clients. And, uh, you know, that was, you know, a, a very significant part of our, our life at that particular time. And I would share ideas, you know, I said that, and it was really kind of interesting because I, I kind of knew in my heart that if they did this, this would happen. And, uh, and, and I was getting a little sensitive about it because I would be teaching seminars all over the, the, the United States and Canada during that period of time where we had clients in, in I think 16 or 20 different areas where I was going to almost every other month. And uh, so we had all of these people together 
and I would say, now, if you do this, this will happen. And, uh, and I'm getting a little bit nervous about it because I'd never done it before. I mean, in other words, I'm suggesting an idea that I'd never even considered before, but intuitively I knew that that would happen. And, uh, and so I'd, I'd say it somewhat reflectively, but at the same time, a little bit concerned. And, and then the next time I'd, or I'd get a phone call the next week and they say, Jerry. And uh, I say, what? And he says, you know what? This really works. <laughs> And, and, and they were just amazed by the fact that, yeah, this really works. If you do this, this really works. And so I've been very, very, I'm, I'm much more um, a pr practitioner than a, than a philosopher. Uh, I, I've just, you know, spent an, an entire career, believe it or not, you know, basically doing the same thing for, for 50 years or more. And, and basically saying, okay, if, if, if you do these things, I can promise you that you will have success. And it's something that's easy to do because we're building relationships. Remember one of the greatest rules of development is the rule of linkage. Now I have a whole list of rules that I suggest to people and we have books I've written, you know, eight or 10 books on development and I can more than happy share them with you if you would like one. But, but the realities are, you know, that closer the linkage, the better the likelihood. It's one of the great uh, rules of development because if, you're, if you link with someone, then you have a greater likelihood to hear. So but basically, so much of what it is we do is we want to create linkage with people so that they can begin the process or we can begin the process with them to, to, to really develop an organization. 